Hey, thanks for coming by the workshop. I'm about to show you how to make this entire diorama here. This was designed with one six scale figures in mind, but of course you could fit one 12 scale or any scale you want into this. And all the techniques in this video, you can apply to any scale, any action figure, any concept you want. There's actually quite a bit of information in here. As is the case with all of my videos, the information therein is timeless and can be applied to any diorama or project that you're working on. So feel free to check out all the other videos we have on the channel. Thanks for coming by the workshop. For this diorama, I started by making a sketch of the rough idea that I had in my head, as well as adding some dimensions that I thought would be about the right size to fit a 1-6 scale figure. This pink stuff is actually insulation foam, most commonly known as expanded polystyrene foam or XPS or even EPS foam. There's a link below where you can get some of this stuff in project size panels off Amazon if you cannot find it at your local Home Depot. I'm using a T-square to mark off the width of my base and the width of my back wall so that I can cut a nice straight line. I like using an extendable box cutter like this DeWalt one. I use it all the time to cut through this foam. It's also very helpful because you can keep nice straight perpendicular lines. So I'm making sure to try to keep the knife as perpendicular to the piece of foam as possible, especially in the first few passes that I do through the foam. And this type of knife really helps you to do that easily. That's my first pass there. And I'm really only going about that deep in the tip of the knife. And I'm gonna do that a couple more times before I push all the way through, just to try to keep my knife blade and my cut as perfectly perpendicular to that table and to that foam as possible so that my cut ends up as straight as possible. As you can see, my cut is at a very slight angle. Instead of a perfect 90 degrees, it's probably about like 88 degrees or something like that. But that's good enough for this type of work. Um, we're not trying to go for absolutely laser perfect precision, but we try as best we can. This cut, as you'll see in a minute, gets a little bit more wibbly wobbly, but I'll show you another way to fix that. So this angle is a little bit too um, off for me to go ahead and accept that. So I'm gonna go ahead and slice this off in my hot wire cutting table here. I set my fence to about one inch back from that wire, plugged it in and it gets hot so that I can slice right through this foam really easily. You can get one of these at hwff.com or at Amazon. Links are in the description below. This now has two nice little 90 degree corners on it. So I'm gonna save this scrap piece and use it possibly for detail on another diorama in the future. So another way you can correct the angle of the edge that you just cut is by using some sandpaper. This is a rubber sanding block and a piece of 120 grit sandpaper. And as long as you don't push too hard into the foam and you let the sandpaper do the work, it can nicely straighten out edges for you or even round over edges if that's what you want. So you just gotta keep at it a few times and you can knock down those angles. With the base and the back wall of the diorama to our liking, I'm gonna move on to making some features. This is two inch thick insulation foam I got at Home Depot. This comes in large sheets that you do have to break down. So this is a scrap I had that I'm just shaving off the backside to create a nice flat edge for mounting to the diorama back wall. I'm also going to use a speed square like you see here to give myself a 90 degree indication mark so that I can slice that off on my hot wire cutter to create myself a nice 90 degree corner. I'm using this Sharpie to sketch out my final profile shape of how I want this feature to look based off my original sketch. I like using Sharpies because as long as you don't push hard, uh, you can easily paint over any markings you make and they'll disappear. And once I get that finished, I cut it out freehand on my hot wire cutter. It's best for doing complex curves like this. I like to use sewing needle pins to hold the foam together because I don't necessarily like gluing things together until I know that I'm 100% ready. And using a square like that and these pins to hold things in place is nice when you're trying to decide exactly where you want to lay features and you're not ready to glue. 
I have this cutoff from the uh, feature that I just made, and I was thinking it might be nice to use it as an additional feature or to create some more interest to the piece. So I use my speed square again, then mark a bottom, and then trim it off of my hot wire foam cutter, and then use the straight edge to mark the back, and then trim that off on my hot wire foam cutter. So I am now finalizing the shape of my back wall. In my original sketch, I intended to have a little bit of a sort of a half archway. And I'm just using a straight edge and uh, my lunch to basically do that curve. This is a salad bowl I had bought earlier in the day and it seemed to actually be pretty much the perfect shape. So I'm using it as a template. And yes, I am sketching on uh, this shape a second time because I thought it would be interesting to create sort of a tiered effect on this wall just to add a little bit more detail to the piece. You don't have to do things like this, but sometimes I kind of get inspired and just uh, go for it. So with this detailed piece that I've created, I'm actually going to rip it down the center. That's a carpentry term used to do lengthwise cuts along the length of a board. I'm just doing that here to create basically a thinner wall section so that I can do that. This is by far, in my opinion, the best and most versatile glue for gluing together these hard, expanded insulation foams like this. It is linked below for you to grab some on Amazon if you'd like to get some of this exact same glue that I'm using. And of course, I'm using sewing needle pins again to hold this in place just so that it doesn't want to bend or glue in sort of an odd finished shape. I'm using that good old Sharpie again to sketch where I want my features to be on the back wall and bottom of my diorama because we are about to make some major cuts and we're gonna replace some of the hard insulation foam with this green floral foam or dry foam that you see in my left hand. So it's important to mark out where you want things to be for this next stage of the process. So I'm sketching out some shapes uh, that'll help be a visual guide for me because we're going to be cutting out probably two large sections out of what we've already created here and replacing it with this floral foam because we're going to create a secondary texture. So I'm just tracing that how I think looks visually appealing. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to sketch on the basic shapes of the sandstone blocks that I'm going to try to create out of this floral foam uh, to make sure that the where I place them, how I stack them, and how I lay them out uh, is going to visually be appealing. So this is just kind of a reference sketch for my own brain. So same process as before with this floral foam. Incidentally though, this floral foam is much, much weaker at this stage and it is actually quite easier to cut. I'm just breaking it down using my straight edges to the size of those blocks that I drew on the pink insulation foam you see in the top of the screen. So just breaking those down until they are the correct depth and then I can cut them down in the correct heights and widths. I'm just using some 120 grit sandpaper to round over and knock down the edges that are going to be facing uh, the front of the diorama. I just thought this would look more visually interesting, make the blocks look like they were going to be hewn or even worn down uh, over the years and the edges were not so sharp. And then I'm just taking these and I am gluing them together with that same glue that I used before, that EPS glue. Uh, which is linked below and we are stacking these to essentially fill roughly the same space as those shapes that we already drew onto our pink foam. If 
If you're enjoying the progress of this build so far, or if you've learned something new, please hit that like and subscribe. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Next step to reinforce this uh, fairly weak floral foam is to just push some skewers all the way through those bricks to just add some rigidity and strength to these before we move on to the next step. I am now cutting out with my hot wire foam cutter the shape that we created on the bottom with that brick pattern in it. And we're gonna use this piece that I just cut off as basically a template or a guide to trim off all of the excess foam so that we end up with a green floral foam section that can fit right into the section that we just cut out. Diorama Puzzle Making 101. So now that we know this shape fits, we can go ahead and glue this into place as a replacement uh, for what we just removed. And we're going back to that lovely EPS glue again that I've mentioned several times. All I'm doing here is using a straight edge and the flat side of my extendable blade to trim out this section so that we can carry that beautiful little wall detail we created and that shape all the way down through that full section of texture. I'm going back to those skewers and using those skewers through the floral foam and now into the pink foam to help reinforce the bond between those two edges. This is the most important step in using this floral foam. This is what's going to strengthen the floral foam up. You are going to spread either Mod Podge or tacky glue or white glue or PVA glue, any type of PVA glue, uh, all over this stuff. You're going to want to do probably two uh, evenly coated layers. The thicker you go, the less the texture you have at the end. The thinner you go, the weaker it will be. So keep that in mind in doing this. And everything you just saw me do on that lower section, I'm going to repeat for this upper section. At this point, all of the structural sculpting was done, so I'm going ahead and gluing everything together in its place before we move on to the next step. I also decided to create a little extra detail like a broken piece of sandstone block uh, for the front corner of the diorama, just using a broken piece of floral foam and gluing it down and putting some Mod Podge on it. So this had the chance to cure and dry overnight before I moved on. I thought it would be fun to test out a figure and make sure everything was looking good and I'm very happy with it thus far. I did an additional step where I laid down some Mod Podge in some strategic areas like that back corner there and in the front and I sprinkled some plain unscented kitty litter on top of that Mod Podge and let that dry overnight with it just to add some interest to the piece. It adds some rubble and some weather pieces and just some generic stone. It works excellent, excellent, excellent for adding detail. Now moving on to our second wall texture using all-purpose spackling paste. Now you don't have to have this exact one or this exact brand, just as long as it's basic spackling paste. These are a couple of little spreading tools that I got. Uh, it's actually one big spreading tool I got at the uh, hardware store that I cut into a few pieces so that I could use it. But you don't have to have a fancy one like this. You can get a spackling paste knife, or you can even just use a cut off piece of cardboard. Because all you're gonna be doing with this spackling paste is just spreading it around, and you're actually going for a sort of randomness to it. So there is no perfect tool. Basically, it's really just about uh, using your own uh, creativity to spread this around to your liking. So something to be mindful of with this because we're using two different textures and the goal in this is to kind of make this texture we're spreading now look like it is the overlayment 
to those uh, large sandstone blocks that we put in. So we want this texture we're spreading to kind of abut the edges and maybe start to overlap a little bit of those blocks, but not completely cover them because we're gonna actually uh, sand this down later after it dries uh, to create a little bit more smoothness and weathering on top of it. This is light duty frog tape and this is blue painters tape. They're basically just both different types of masking tape. If you have the tan masking tape, the green masking tape, that all works just fine for this step. All we're trying to do is create a temporary fence made out of tape all the way around the base of the diorama. So I am trying intentionally not to let the tape drop below the edge of the base because we are gonna to need to flip this up for the next step, which is putting down a very thick layer uh, well, I shouldn't say very thick, but reasonably thick layer of Mod Podge all around the part of the base that we haven't glued anything to yet because that is what we're going to add our texture to. I am just using a folded piece of paper to distribute play sand on top of that Mod Podge we just laid down. And this is just plain old normal play sand. You can get it in a 60 pound bag at the hardware store. It's usually less than 10 bucks for that 60 pound bag. It's much cheaper than the craft store and is a finer sand. Now that we have that sand laid around, we're gonna go ahead and tilt our diorama around. And this is where that fence that we created out of tape comes in really handy. We can tap around the sand to make sure that it gets evenly coated on our Mod Podge layer. In my original sketch, I laid out uh, the idea for maybe a tattered fabric overhang on some broken beams, and that's all that I'm designing here. And I'm using this 3 8 inch diameter dowel rod, and I'm just simply breaking it off to create my first piece here. You see me right there using a uh, hobby miter box. That's M-I-T-R-E, miter box saw. There's a link below to grab one if you don't have one. They're extremely helpful for cutting down linear material, whether it's plastic, metal, or wood uh, for small projects like this. I'm just simply pressing the dowels into those holes to get them started so I have a location. Getting my X-Acto knife and sort of getting those holes a little bit deeper, cutting them out, and then eventually switching to some pliers so that I can sort of pull out the excess foam I would not recommend using a drill for such a large hole in foam as it would probably just tear it out and might make the hole wonky. I also decided it would be nice to, uh, visually and also structurally to add a support pole. So I did the same basic process that I've already done just with this pole and marked on the larger dowel where that intersection is going to be with some pen and uh, went ahead and got my power drill out, be careful guys, and used a 1 16th inch drill bit to drill at the angle uh, through that that I needed to match the angle of the intersecting support piece. I took a finishing nail and nipped off the head with my pliers there and just super glued it through both wood pieces to make sure it had some structural integrity to it. This is black coated or annealed wire. This stuff is very, very helpful for lots of things. I'm taking this annealed wire and wrapping it around a scrap piece of dowel to get it started because it's gonna act as a support structure uh, to kind of hold my fabric in place or at least drape it uh, how I want so that it can stay in position. And I'm just wrapping it around the dowels accordingly in sort of the droop shape or the drape shape that I want it to hang uh, when I eventually actually put fabric over this structure. Thank you. 
So I created a temporary holding piece of foam here for my drape structure because the next step, I didn't want to drip any of the material uh, that we're going to sort of impregnate the fabric with onto the diorama that we've already created. So as you can see, I've got some blue fabric that I like. I'm just cutting out a basic shape to drape over all of that and draping it over. And then I'm just going to kind of mark where I need to cut and trim so that things sort of fall down around those wire and dowel rod intersections the way that I was envisioning in my original sketch. I'm just adding some weathering to the edges of this fabric by just kind of slicing it up with my knife, dragging this wire wheel over it. Of course, you can use a wire brush if that's what you've got, or even some sandpaper just to kind of make it look like it's been hanging up there for a while and it's had to endure some elements. And uh, before I move on to the next step, I decided to do a little bit of a sort of a quick stain on my wood dowels. I actually made this out of uh, mostly water and a little bit of paint. If you don't have any actual wood stain lying around, this works just fine for something small like this. And now we're mixing up a concoction of water, some dark black, uh, dark brown paints for weathering effects, and some Mod Podge. Um, you, there is no perfect formula for this. You just need enough Mod Podge to kind of create a stiffener for the fabric because we're now soaking that fabric in that Mod Podge uh, weathering paint and water mixture and then draping it over that structure we created so that it will sort of form around that structure and hold its shape with the Mod Podge weathering mixture we created. That glue will sort of act as a stiffener and help it harden in place. This next step is just a matter of personal taste. I'm running over this uh, drywall putty with 120 grit sandpaper to knock down all the sort of hard and sharp edges that dried. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. It's just kind of what you want it to look like. Then I'm deciding to smooth out those edges just a little bit for my piece. I went ahead and started black coating the base edges and the rear of the diorama since we're going to be moving on to the actual paint stage. Uh, you don't have to do this now, I just decided to do it since I was waiting for glues to dry. And it is now the next day and you can see how stiff that fabric ended up. It's so stiff when you take it off of the piece before gluing it down, since it's not glued down yet, it actually holds its shape, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted this to kind of hold the shape that I dictated it to be in so that it would never fall off or change. And before we paint the rest of the diorama, I went ahead and removed that whole apparatus for the fabric and mixed up this wash that is a combination of colors to my liking. It's sort of a yellowy, tanny gray color uh, with a lot of water in it. And I'm just doing a wash over all of the uh, sand-based parts of the diorama, everything that I kind of envisioned being made of the earthy, sandy parts of the world that this uh, diorama comes from as sort of a base coat for all of the same material of that ilk. Went ahead and mixed up a custom base color that I liked for the overlaid plaster part of this. I really like this sort of uh, slate blue, dark medium earth tone slate blue, and I went ahead and covered all of the opposing texture with this color as its base coat. After that initial wash, I went over the stone pieces with sort of a medium gray base that I came up with. And now I'm remixing those original tones from that original wash with that gray to create sort of a lighter in-between color. And I'm just sort of dabbing it uh, in highlight areas where I think uh, maybe where people stepped or where weathering would occur or on the edges like you see on these uh, sort of blocks here, just to create some visual interest and some variation. Uh, to make things look a little bit more natural. Even just a slightly lighter tone um, before we move on to highlights and lowlights and washes.
speaking of washes, I took the same tones again that I started with and I just lightened them up with more of the light colors in those tones and added a bunch of water and now I'm basically doing a wash, a light wash now, over all that same sort of sandstone material made of that natural uh, rock or minerals from this planet that this is supposed to be from. And then I'm gonna go back after I've sort of covered this in the way that I thought looked nice and soak up uh, some of that with a paper towel sort of strategically to create some more visual interest and variation. So again, I took some of those same blue tones I used before and I just lightened them up to do a dry brushing layer over what I already laid down uh, to create some highlights over sort of my shadow layer or my base layer. And then I created a medium blue that I decided to brighten up with more of a blue pop. And uh, I'm laying this down and I'm not going perfectly with it. I'm just kind of indiscriminately putting it down. And then again, kind of what I did on the base, I'm sort of wiping off what I don't want to create variations in the tones. For sort of a final detail before we move on to the washes, I decided to take this color that I love called Spiced Berry. It's sort of a burgundy wine rusty color and uh, create some cool detail here and spell some stuff out in Arabesh. Uh, if any of you can figure out what I wrote, type it in the comments below. I don't even remember what I wrote. <laughs> and this is sort of the last step in painting here as I made a, uh, a wash out of uh, sort of blacks and grays. And I'm going over pretty much the entire piece with that. And I'm doing more of it in the corners and less of it in the flat surfaces just because that's where maybe moisture and water would pool if there was atmospherics on this planet like rain and uh, allowing it to sort of just drip down naturally and then maybe guiding it with my brush just kind of brushing down and even brushing up and then where it's too heavy just kind of taking the paper towel in my left hand and dabbing it off wherever i feel like is necessary Final step here was to glue in the apparatus we made for the overhang of the fabric and then glue the fabric to the apparatus. Of course, once the diorama is done, you gotta test your figures in it, right? Well, this one is the Tank Trooper from the movie Rogue One, and this diorama was inspired by Jetta City from Rogue One, which is where this guy first appeared. But uh, definitely was happy with the way this diorama looked with other figures, like my Mandalorian figures and the OG Mandalorian Mr. Boba Fett. Even though this diorama is themed with sort of a Star Wars vibe in mind, that doesn't mean you can't take the techniques that I showed here in this video and use them for anything that you want. Go nuts. So, this was made over the course of my first three live streams, OW Art Live number one, two, and three. If you'd like to see everything you just saw in way more detail, with me doing a lot more explaining, go check out OW Art Live one, two, and three on the Live Builds playlist here on this channel. Thanks for watching, happy building. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments below. I hope you have an awesome day. Thanks for coming by the workshop.